characters? May I have a word, sir? Sure, what is it? Sir, how many episodes are you planning for the Su-57 series? Quite a few more, actually, because, well, the aircraft is very peculiar and the hardware is little known, so there's not much stuff that I can give for granted. You may be interested to learn that one of the voice-activated coffee machines in the canteen of the upper floor of the Sukhoi Bureau no, Design Office No, no, this has to stop. You will end up getting in trouble. Actually, no. I, I will end up getting in trouble because nobody will believe that you did it yourself. Is there any electronic device in the world that you're not connected with in any way, shape or form? Of course, sir. I have no acquaintance whatsoever with the clipper you use to cut your pubic hair, sir. This is the third episode of the series dedicated to the Sukhoi 57 and in this episode we will start discussing the avionics and the systems. The previous episodes were about the general configurations, the aerodynamics and the propulsion. And if you didn't watch those videos there will be links above and there will be links below. The Sukhoi 57 for the Russians is a quantum leap According to the designers, the system is entirely modular with a data bus connecting all the computers. I have found no mention of an open architecture in the same way it is used in Western designs, but I would not be surprised if the Russian had defined a minimum interoperability protocol, because that would just be the logical thing to do. Why it would be? Because an open architecture would allow for uh, software updates without having to recertify and retest everything. Updating the software or adding a component would just be similar to what you do on your computer when you install a new application or you connect a new piece of hardware. Well, it's not that simple to be honest, but I think I got the point across. Always according to the Suhoi Bureau, the plane has a lot of spare room and a lot of spare electrical power for new or upgraded systems. It has been designed with upgradability in mind. This is a favorable condition for the longevity of the aircraft, but also to accommodate any particular requirement that an export client may have. The interaction between the pilot and the aircraft is managed by what the Russians call an IUS unit. Uh, well, it can loosely be translated as information and control system. The computer has been designed by Suhoi itself without relying on the usual Suhoi supplier, the RPKB from Ravenskoye. The reason for this is that Suhoi wanted to go with the best possible system that they were able to build they decided to make no compromise on the system technology. The concept that they have followed is called intellectual assistance. With this term, the Russians describe the process of presenting the pilot with only the relevant information for that specific flight condition or the automation of all the tasks that are better and more precisely executed without human intervention. Up to 90% of a mission can be flown automatically, with the pilot manually flying the plane only during takeoff and landing. The mission can be pre programmed, like the Russians like to do, particularly for the air to ground domain, but obviously the pilot in flight can change everything, can set new waypoints, change altitude and speed, choose flight profiles, and so on. In this way, a large part of the pilot attention can be focused on the mission itself. Some may say that this approach might reduce the amount of training required to effectively fly the plane, but I personally don't believe that they're going to go down that path because it may be very, very dangerous and may go wrong very, very quickly if things do not go as expected. We know that at least one test of automatic flying has been successfully conducted with the pilot just sitting in the cockpit as a spectator. 
However, we don't know whether this is going to become an operational feature for useful, for example, for high risk uh, suicidal missions. Well, honestly, it doesn't seem very likely, but many of the sixth generation fighters projects currently ongoing do include this optionally manned feature, which I'm still struggling to really understand if it could be useful in a real conflict, in real operational conditions. However, there is at least one case in which it could really be useful, that is taking home a wounded or an unconscious pilot. The Sukhoi 57 has one of the richest sensor suite ever installed on a fighter. Actually, Piotr Butowski, in his book on the Sukhoi 57 Fallon, has a really interesting picture that summarizes all the systems installed on the aircraft, but yeah, I'm afraid I can't use this in the video. We will cover this in detail, but for now what's important to understand is that a lot of sensors means also the risk of information overload. So sensors and information fusion is an essential feature to assist the pilot's job. This function in the Suhoi 57 is performed by the IUS. So the pilot, while not flying the plane, can automate the target search, the attack profiles, the kind of firing solutions that are chosen. I believe this could be really useful, but could also be a double-edged sword. The standardization of combat procedure in case of a generalized and prolonged conflict, it is a vulnerability that can be exploited by the enemy so during a long conflict, during a long period of time, and for long I mean uh, more than a few days, it may be necessary to actually vary these procedures and these policies in a way that is not easily understood by the opponent. The Suhoi 57 obviously features a secure data link, which we know very little about. The Russians have quite an important experience with long-range data links, which are necessary for a country that has the size of Russia. However, we can expect the Suhoi 57 to be quite capable, even though we don't have any specific information. The reason is that we know that Tactical experiments where the Sukhoi 57 was acting as the quarterback for the previous generation Sukhoi 35s have been conducted. Yes, that's exactly the same function that the F 35 is supposed to perform together with the F 16s and the F 15s. We don't know the result of the test, but if the plane is interoperable with Sukhoi 35, we know that the Sukhoi 35 data link is quite capable. For example, the commander of a Sukhoi 35 formation can physically provide the other plane's weapons with the firing solutions, leaving the other pilots in the flight the only task of uh, materially pulling the trigger. It only seems logical that this kind of centralized command is implemented on the Suhoi 57 too. A further function of the IUS is the automated the aircraft self-defense. An automated system now is quite common and the Suhoi 57 features radio frequency jammers, infrared jammers, uh, plus the usual dispensers of chuffs and flares. Obviously, all of these systems have to work in a coordinated way to maximize the effectiveness. Anyway, we will cover this in detail in a different episode. The production Sukhoi 57 has a different cockpit layout than the Pak FA. The Pak FA cockpit was sort of reminiscent of older generations. The production Sukhoi 57 is much more modern. So the general configuration is the classic HOTAS, that handsome throttle and sticks, but there are no analog uh, instruments of any kind. There is just one large panoramic screen as it is commonplace 
in the most modern uh, fighters. There's actually another small multifunction display mostly used for the communication management. The HUD is probably the largest ever installed on a Russian fighter, but on the Sukhoi 57 it may not be that necessary. In fact, the pilot's helmet makes use of augmented reality to show the flight information to the pilot uh, as it is appropriate considering the flying conditions. The head-up display information is replicated on the helmet, but obviously the helmet can also be used as a, the targeting device for the off-board sight weapons. One uncommon feature present on the Suhoi 57 is the capability of showing the picture captured by the four infrared cameras distributed around the on the helmet. If the pilot activates this function, can actually see through the structure of the plane. Yes, guys, that's exactly the same feature available on the F-35. However, on the Sukhoi 57, the cameras do not cover 360 degrees and they are used mostly for night navigation and low-level flight. But this will be the subject of one of the coming episodes where we will dive deep into the details of all the electromagnetic and electroptic systems that are available on the Sukhoi 57. That's all I have for now. Thank you for watching and stay tuned.